Hello, and welcome to Clearer Thinking with Spencer Greenberg, the podcast about ideas that matter. I'm Josh Castle, the producer of the podcast, and I'm so glad you've joined us today. In this episode, Spencer speaks with Andrea Dunlop about Munchausen syndrome, Munchausen by proxy, and attention and narcissism. A quick word of warning. In this episode, the topic of child abuse is discussed. So if you are particularly sensitive to that topic, then please take care when listening. And now, here's the conversation between Spencer and Andrea. Andrea, welcome. Thank you so much for having me, Spencer. So one thing that I spent a lot of my time doing is trying to understand human psychology better. And I think a really interesting test case for human psychology is to look at extremes where people have very unusual behaviors. And the reason I wanted to invite you on today is to talk about one of the most strange behaviors that I've ever heard of uh, happening among humans. And I know you personally have had an interesting experience with this. So why don't we start actually talking about Munchausen syndrome, and then from there, we'll go into the actual subject of this episode, which is going to be about Munchausen by proxy. Sure. Yes, it is definitely at the extreme of of human behavior. That's a that's an apt description. So Munchausen syndrome, which I'm just going to throw out a couple of sort of more official terms, just because I think that that's important. However, I do use Munchausen and Munchausen by proxy all the time. But Munchausen syndrome, which is also called factitious disorder, is a condition in which someone exaggerates, invents, or inflicts illness on themselves for the purposes of sympathy and attention. So it is a strange behavior. I think that I always like to sort of bring it down to earth by telling people that it is sort of a very extreme version of a behavior that a lot of us can probably relate with, which is sort of that notion of having people take care of you and feel you know, like you are getting people's attention and and people are are looking after you and that thing of, you know, that we all do, at least to some degree when we're kids, right, of, of pretending we're a little bit sicker than we are so that we can stay home from school and maybe our mom's going to, you know, give us some some extra love. So I always like to frame it like that so it doesn't sound quite so, I guess, off the spectrum bizarre. Right. And yeah, probably many people have that experience of kind of exaggerating how sick they are because it makes people treat them in a certain way or be more sympathetic or so on, especially as children, where it starts to get, I think, especially peculiar is when it's a completely fictitious syndrome that they're suffering from that they're just using for attention. So to be Munchausen syndrome, does it have to be completely made up or could it just be an exaggeration? No, exaggeration counts. And I think that that is one of the very common misconceptions about both Munchausen and Munchausen by proxy is that if there is the existence of some underlying condition, then that sort of, quote, proves that that person is not um, is not committing that act. So in obviously much more serious in the case of Munchausen by proxy because it's child abuse. But even, you know, Munchausen, again, you know, a lot of the cases, especially the ones that are sort of making headlines will be things like, you know, these very serious long-term fake cancer stories that turn out not to be true. But there also is, you know, a version of this behavior that is someone who does have, you know, some kind of chronic condition that really amplifies and exaggerates their symptoms, again, in order for an intrinsic reward. So, you know, another thing to always have folks understand is that it is separate from another disorder called malingering, which is when you do some of those same behaviors, you know, again, exaggerating, inducing, or inventing an illness in yourself, but it's for an external reward, right? So to get out of school, for example, so I guess all kids engage in some malingering is what I'm saying, um, to get out of military service, to get out of work, or, you know, you're just doing a fraudulent GoFundMe page. Now, it can get confusing because there usually are, you know, in these in these larger cases that go on for years and years, there usually are things like some fraudulent fundraising and some other sort of external rewards. But the difference being that they would do it in the absence of those external rewards. So really that intrinsic reward of, of getting attention and sympathy is thought to be the main thing. Yeah, and certainly in scenarios where there's a draft. Some people are going to, you know, pretend to be sick to avoid the draft and, you know, they're afraid of war or they think it's an unjust war and they don't want to go kill people. You know, you, you, I think that happens a lot and we can all understand that in that kind of scenario that's going to happen. But that's really different than doing it for attention or 
to get people to treat you differently. Right. Correct. Yeah. And I think that, you know, it's and I think that's why it's so baffling to people is because they're thinking, well, they're not. I think it's much easier to explain right to your point that if they're getting out of, you know, going to war or if they did it so that they could fraudulently raise a million dollars for cancer treatment they didn't need and then, you know, used it to go on a trip around the world or buy a house or something. You know, I think those are actually much more easy to understand than someone that would engage in that behavior in a long term way that really hurts and exploits other people for the purposes of getting their emotional needs met. But, you know, what I've come to understand in in many years of thinking about this and engaging with this is that actually getting our emotional needs met is one of the most powerful drivers of human behaviors, that actually to feel loved is something that people will do almost anything for. Yeah, that's a really interesting point where we can maybe relate on some level more with someone who who might you know pretend to be sick or hurt themselves to avoid some you know calamity or avoid something they really really don't want to do but then when you think about well like love and and you know acceptance and so on well aren't those actually incredibly important things to us and so you know is it that shocking that someone would engage in this behavior for those things but but you know I think that um I think it is simply less relatable even though we all want those things we all want love and acceptance Maybe most people have an intuition that getting it through deception isn't the real thing, right? Like if someone loves you only because you tricked them or if someone, you know, showing you sympathy because you're, you're tricking them, that, that it somehow degrades it. Right. I mean, yes. And I, I think for most of us, we would feel, you know, such a discomfort with lying to especially, you know, our, our friends and family and those closest to us and knowing that people are, you know, it's it sort of you can you can understand fr from a distance, right, what the reward is. I mean, I think we can all probably think of times in our life when we were going through something really hard, like an illness or even just, you know, I've had I've had two babies in the last, you know, five years. And when you have a new baby, Maybe people, you know, hopefully like in your life, like really show up for you and they go out of their way and they, you know, take time out of their schedule to make you meals. And there's all this. And, and that's a nice feeling, right? It's nice to to have people show up for you in that way when you need them. Now, most of us wouldn't go so far as fraudulently creating a need to get that. And so I think to your point, like if you were being deceptive about it, that would sort of <laughs> negate the reward for for many of us. But I think for folks that have this, you know, it is it is like it, deception is an integral part of it, right? And it's the other thing that I've seen with looking at a lot of these cases that involve both Munchausen and Munchausen by proxy is it's never isolated to health things, right? It's never just that they're lying about their health. I mean, there is a massive pattern of lying about all kinds of other things, you know, financial fraud, lying at work, um, infidelity in their relationships. You know, you see this huge sort of just pattern of, of really pathological lying that goes back even before, you know, someone can kind of identify when they started lying about their, their health issues. So it is an overall state of mind and it's connected to a lot of other personality disorders that are difficult to deal with on their own. So those cluster B personality disorders that I feel like people are a lot more familiar with these days because of <laughs> TikTok and podcasts, et cetera. Um, but, you know, narcissistic personality disorder, borderline personality disorder, histrionic personality disorder. And again, those things on their own without the fetish disorders are, are hard enough to deal with. So it is sort of an overall question of someone that is is really using a different playbook than the rest of us, I would say. So let's transition to talking about the subject of this podcast, which is going to be Munchausen by proxy. You tell us what that is and how that differs from Munchausen, and then we'll get into your story and, and kind of talk about how you came to be so interested in this. Sure. So I like to describe Munchausen by proxy as the sort of colloquial term that we use to describe two separate but intertwined things, one of which is the you know underlying mental disorder that someone who does this has, which is factitious disorder imposed on another. So again, that's when someone is, you know, exaggerating, inducing, or inventing illness, this time in someone they're caring for, so in someone else, not themselves. So almost always the mother of a child for the purposes of sympathy and attention. And then the other thing that we use Munchausen to uh, by proxy to describe is the act of medical child abuse, which is when someone is, you know, using deception to, again, exaggerate, induce, invent, you know, illness and harming a child with that. So I think the thing that really distinguishes Munchausen by proxy and makes it 
you know, a much sort of bigger concern from a community standpoint, not that Munchausen behavior is not also, you know, cannot also be devastating to people involved. But obviously, whenever you're talking about harming a child, that's a very serious thing. And in, you know, in medical child abuse, there is a higher death rate than any other form of child abuse is thought to be around six to nine percent. Oh, wow. So six to nine percent of the time of these cases, the child actually dies from it. Yeah. And, and, you know, just to be clear here to the listener, we're not just talking about a parent, you know, telling their friends that their child is sick. Like we're often talking about much more extreme behaviors. So do you want to give some examples of the kind of behaviors that might be typical? Yeah. So, I mean, and to be clear, there can be a wide range of behavior that falls under this umbrella, right, that, that goes along the spectrum. So someone who's, who is a friend of mine and also has appeared on my show, Nobody Should Believe Me, which is an investigative true crime podcast about Munchausen by proxy cases, um, Dr. Mark Feldman. He's really one of the foremost experts in the world on factitious disorders. And he actually coined something called Munchausen by Internet, right, which is when people do these same behaviors, but they really keep them to the online sphere. So it's sometimes people, you know, are either inventing their own illnesses or there's been cases where people have invented an entire family with fake children who are suffering from cancer and they find other people's, you know, photos of children who are actually in the hospital and et cetera, and sort of build out these entire fake lives, right? But it's it's a similar behavior in that the reward that they're getting out of that is again, attention, sympathy. Now, for most of us, right, like coming up with an entire fake identity to get those things would be, would completely, again, negate the benefit of those things. But that's why it's a very sort of compulsive behavior. And I think what's interesting about how this plays out online is that, of course, like there are a lot of people who have real children who also sort of amplify this behavior online. And every expert I've spoken to really thinks that the presence of both the accessibility of, you know, any information about any diagnosis or disorder you could possibly hope to research is a few clicks away. So that makes it much easier to commit. And then also the, you know, resources for getting attention because of social media and online forums, et cetera, et cetera, have become infinite, right? So those things have really collided to make this problem a lot worse. It used to be a lot harder to pull off. You know, we talk about a number of different cases on on the show, and I always want to preface this by saying that just because these issues show up in a lot of Munchausen by proxy cases does not mean that we should look upon parents who have children who have these actual issues with any additional suspicion. You know, it's not a causal relationship that way. But we do see a lot of premature birth. That's something I've seen in almost every case. There are a lot of things then that follow that sort of feeding issues. So things where you'll see babies diagnosed as failure to thrive, which is a catch-all term for babies who are not sort of developing or gaining weight or growing the way that they should. And then you will, you know, have parents take progressively serious, you know, medical interventions to deal with the failure to thrive. So a lot of times you see, you know, first starting with a nasal gastric feeding tube, which is the one that goes in through the nose and then moving on to a surgically implanted feeding tube. And I mean, again, those feeding tubes are something I've seen in almost every case. And now, of course, there are a lot of children who have those legitimate issues, right? But the difference here being that the parent is lying about the reason that the child is not gaining weight. The reason the child is not gaining weight in these cases is because the parent isn't actually feeding them, but they are telling the doctor that they are. And so again, that intentional deception is always a hallmark of these cases. It is not kids with complex medical issues, and it's not even parents who are, you know, overly anxious or even suffering from delusions, right? Like sometimes people will over-medicalize their children or inappropriately medicalize their children because they actually think they're sick. This is very different. These parents know their children are not sick, and they're doing this behavior in a very purposeful and premeditated way. So really, you know, anything, I've seen a lot of things that sort of like sort of fit into these patterns. So again, I talked about the feeding issues. Another thing that comes up a lot is like breathing issues. So things around asthma, a lot of seizures that no one else ever sees. Um, so really anything that is not going to show up on a simple blood test or x-ray or is something where the test could be messed with. I mean, I think what has really been illuminated for me going through so many of these cases is that just how much 
of what a doctor does, and especially in pediatrics, especially if you have a very young child who is not verbal yet, you are really completely dependent on the parent telling you a history and the parent giving you a record of their symptoms. And now, I mean, I have two little kids, so it's like I look at what those doctor visits look like. They're usually short and they're usually just asking me, hey, what's going on with your baby? And their job is completely dependent on telling me the truth. And if I don't tell them the truth, they're going to come to the wrong diagnosis. So that is what happens in these cases. Right. So I just want to emphasize just the level of disturbing behavior that's occurring here, because we're talking about you know, often a baby or a young child, a parent is going to the doctor saying, my child is having all these problems, when in fact, these problems are being induced by the parent. And then they're getting, knowingly getting unnecessary medical procedures to treat this non-existent problem that they themselves created, right? Correct. Correct. Yeah. And it is, you know, and again, kind of back to you were asking about, like, is it, 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 is, you know, what if there is some underlying problem, right? And so something I've heard, you know, there are a lot of cases in the news and, you know, that have been depicted in documentaries and, and this, that, and the other thing about, quote, false accusations or parents saying that they have been falsely accused. And something that sometimes parents will say is, well, they really did have this thing, right? They really did have this underlying issue. Okay, they may have an underlying issue, but if you look at the way that that underlying issue has played out for that child, you know, maybe they have, like, for instance, maybe they were born premature. Now, the prematurity thing is really complex because we know from some of the peer-reviewed literature on this that there are offenders who have, you know, again, it's one of those things that, like, almost every case I've looked at, the baby is born premature, and then you also see when there is more than one child that ba the babies are born increasingly premature. And so there are offenders who have said that they caused that premature birth so that they could start that pattern of getting that medical attention, right? And that they felt that they were getting their emotional needs met by being treated like a high-risk pregnancy, right? And so it begins before the child is even born. But nonetheless, so, you know, you have, they could say, oh, well, this child had all these issues because they were premature. But then you look at, you know, most premature babies, yeah, they have some eating issues right in the beginning, but they usually resolve. They're not still sort of escalating to this mess and that, that method by the time they're, you know, three, four, five years old. So again, it's just always looking for that intentional deception. And it is really disturbing. And I think that is what keeps people from looking at it. I think, you know, having been through an investigation myself, not for, for me, but within my family, you know, I know how hard it is to wrap your head around the fact that someone could do this. And especially the idea, you know, many, many of these moms, and I say moms because it's about 98% of known cases are, are mothers. It's a very female crime. You know, a lot of these moms, they don't look abnormal. They don't seem abnormal. There's nothing off-putting about their, their the way they are. They just seem like really nice normal, loving moms. And I think to be able to look at someone like that and also hold in your mind that they could be capable of doing the most depraved thing you could imagine is is really hard for people. And I understand why, why that's so hard for people. Could the act of answering open-ended questions about yourself give you new, important insights? It turns out the answer is yes, if those questions are selected in just the right way. After running a series of five scientific studies, Clearer Thinking has discovered a specific set of practical, yet rarely asked questions that 83% of people reported were valuable for them to answer, and 78% said they would recommend to others. A remarkably high 88% of people even reported that they enjoyed answering these questions. And Clearer Thinking is now making those questions available to you for free on clearerthinking.org so that you can benefit from them as well. You can also order a beautiful physical card deck of the life-changing questions so that you can use the questions to bond with friends and family. We think you'll be surprised at just how valuable answering these open-ended questions about yourself can be. To answer the free life-changing questions or to find Clearer Thinking's other free tools and mini-courses, head to clearerthinking.org. So let's get into your personal story. Do you want to just kind of go back to the beginning and kind of tell us the progression that you experienced? 
Sure. So yes, I have. Um, I on the first season of my podcast, I talked a little bit about my background with my older sister, and I'm talking about it more directly in this season that is airing right now, season two. So I don't know when this will be coming out. That episode may have aired already. So it, basically, I have an older sister who's been investigated for medical child abuse on two occasions, once for her older son and once for her younger daughter. The second investigation involved a two-year police investigation, um, as well as a CPS investigation that did escalate to a dependency case, i.e. the state made a motion to take her children away. Um, that was denied by a family court judge. There are lots and lots of issues with the way that case played out. I believe the evidence against her was very strong. What I've been able to find in the public record is extremely worrying. I, again, I, I, I talk through that in the in the um, in the second season of my show. But, you know, my my history with her, we have been estranged for about 12 years and my history with her. She had a lot of, again, these Munchausen behaviors that that we talked about at the top of the show that uh, predated her having children, right? So she had, it was kind of a situation where there was just always something with her health. Um, and again, there's a lot of things like anybody involved in these cases, it, it, it one of the profoundly destabilizing things about having someone in your life like this and someone who really deceives you in a major way as she did is that you look back on a lot of your life and you're not totally sure what was real and what wasn't. So there are many things that, you know, I'll never know, presumably, because she's, I don't think, going to give me access to her medical records. And without that, I, I have no way of knowing. But there were a couple of incidents that we knew for sure she was lying, one of which was that she said in high school that she was losing her hair. She said she had alopecia. She had this bald spot on her head. My mother took her to the dermatologist, and the dermatologist told her, actually, she's shaving her hair off, so she's doing it intentionally. So that was obviously an alarming, you know, thing. Um, and, you know, it, it happened when we were both teenage girls. And I think at the time my, my mom tried to get her into some therapy, but not much you can do when someone's 16 or 17. I believe she was 17, you know, if they don't want to go into therapy. And so I think maybe we just filed it under, you know, teenage girls do strange things. Sometimes I can say having been one. Yeah. So that case is really interesting because leaving a bald spot on your head, you might think as a teenage girl that was that would be embarrassing. Like that would, you know, it's the sort of thing where you you think that you would want to try to fit in in school and look as normal as possible. So I'm wondering if you have any insight there of what she was actually seeking. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point. And I think that part of why it's so hard to understand this behavior and part of why it masquerades for so long, right? Part of why it doesn't get maybe detected earlier if people don't know what they're looking at. And certainly my parents had not heard of Munchausen syndrome when they were when we were teenagers is because it seems so like, why would you do that to yourself? Right. Yes. I mean, that that that's every girl's nightmare is to like, you know, have have something terrible happen to their hair. I mean, that's a you know, that's a catastrophe as a teenage girl. And that's not to say anything silly about teenage girls. It's just that that's that's where you're at, you know. But it was something that got her a lot of attention, right? Because people noticed it and said, oh my gosh, what's happening with your hair? And now for me as a teenager, I wouldn't have wanted people to ask me that question, feel sorry for me. But something that I understand about people that battle with Munchausen syndrome is that that is sort of how they are able to feel loved and by people expressing that concern and by people being worried about them. And, and it's, you know, it, it is, it's both sort of, it's both sort of understandable on one level. And then yes, baffling on another level, because most of us just wouldn't want attention for something like that. It reminds me a little bit of in high school, you saw some students that seemed indifferent to whether they got positive attention or negative attention, right? They just like, they wanted attention, whether that was from acting out or from being praised. And it kind of reminds me of that, where just like attention is good, full stop. Yeah, I think that's true. And, you know, the other thing that I think about was like, so I'm I'm very lucky in that <laughs> my family has good bone density. I've never broken a bone. But remember, you know, when you were kids and like if a kid got a broken arm and they had a cast, like it was kind of a cool thing. Right. It was like oh, man, like he has a cast. Everyone's going to sign it like you do. You get attention. And I think like there is a sense that even 
attention for something that's, and that's not exactly ne- negative attention, right? That's sympathy. But it's like, I think that there's something there that we can understand like a little bit of. Now, most of us wouldn't purposefully break our arm or pretend to have a broken arm to get that sympathy. But I think like, you know, maybe like, the cute guy or girl in class notices that you have a broken arm and wants to sign your cast. Like there, there's something there, right. That I think a lot of us can relate to just not again, the degree and not the deceptive angle. A friend of mine in high school, she asked this guy to smash a baseball on her knee to try to induce an injury so she could get out of gym. But I think that was more because she hated gym class so much, which is uh, rather disturbing, but uh, yeah. So Yeah, that is a pretty long way to go to get out of gym class. But, you know, that's just a that's just, again, that low grade malingering that a lot of (laughs) kids engage in. (laughs) High school students not always making the best life decisions, but um, (laughs) exactly. So what was the next sign that in retrospect, you know, maybe at the time you didn't realize it was connected, but in retrospect, you kind of think it was connected? I mean, definitely the next really big thing with health stuff was that she had when we were in our 20s a pregnancy. She was with a boyfriend. I believe actually they were engaged at the time, but she said she was pregnant with twins and then that she lost that pregnancy at about six months in, which is an extremely devastating time to lose a pregnancy. I mean, that is obviously very far along in a pregnancy. We were, my parents and I were both out of town. She called us. She told us this whole series of events and she was going to the hospital and they were trying to save the babies and they couldn't save the babies. And then it all came unraveled over the next several weeks. And we eventually surmised that she was probably never pregnant at all. And to say that was disorienting is a (laughs) massive understatement. I mean, she had looked pregnant. We had a baby shower. They had names. I'd seen ultrasound pictures. I mean, it was very, very elaborate. So that was obviously a huge sort of turning point in understanding what she was capable of lying about. I mean, I imagine that it's incredibly hard to come to the conclusion that your sister is lying about losing a pregnancy, right? Like there must be so much psychological momentum towards believing her in that case. So I'm wondering... How was it that you came to believe that that she was lying? And what was that like for you as her sister? Yeah. So, you know, and yeah, our 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 capacity to believe, especially the people that we love, it really will make us look past a lot of things, right? And I, I think sometimes people can stand outside these situations and think like, well, how could you not, you know, know something was up? And it's just, it, it's not even that we didn't know. It's that when you really, really don't want to see it and you really, really don't want to believe, you have to, it takes a lot. So with that situation, you know, I got a call. I I was living in New York City at the time. So I was back home and I I got a call from my father and he just, I I can't remember exactly what he said. This is a long time ago. But, you know, just basically something's not adding up about what your sister's telling us about losing this pregnancy. And I called her best friend that I had also grown up with and was very close to and asked her, you know, what her take on things was. And what we quickly realized was that she had told everyone a different version of the story, right? So in the story I heard, her best friend had taken her to the hospital. In the story she told her best friend, her fiancé had made at home in time. In the story she told her fiancé, who we came to find out was not her fiancé anymore, you know, it was that a different friend had taken her. So it's just, it became really clear that something was not adding up. And then she went through this pattern, which I've I've now recognized as, as part of the pattern of these behaviors. So it's this sort of deny, justify, minimize, blame. So she did exactly that, right? Whenever we tried to confront her, which I'm not going to overstate my attempts to confront her. It's very hard. It's very hard to sit down and and say to someone, you lied about this huge thing, sort of how could you do it? But, you know, she cried and she, you know, first kind of tried to say that she had lost the pregnancy, but it had been much earlier than she said. And then she sort of changed that story. And then eventually she just blamed her by then ex-fiance. Oh, he had left me. I was so ashamed. I, you know, and and because I wanted it to somehow be his fault makes no logical sense. It was not his fault, this poor man. But 
I was like, yeah, it's his fault. You know, it's like sort of you get on board because I wanted to believe anything but that my sister had done this in a premeditated, purposeful way and let us all believe, you know, let let me believe that I was going to be an auntie. Let me get attached to mythical babies that did not exist. And then let me experience a death, two deaths, and grieve over that situation and for it all ha- uh, to have been a lie. It's just a horrible thing to sit with. And so I think the way I dealt with it at the time was I just sort of didn't, right? I sort of came up with this other explanation of of it was the breakup and she was she's just always been a little troubled and you know just I, I it really like and I, I watch other people do these in these cases when they're being confronted with really hard evidence and I watch people sort of do backflips to convince themselves that it's not what it is and at the one point I think that there's a point where that's no longer acceptable to do especially if a child is in danger but I also understand what they're doing Right. It's like the reality of what your sister did, it seems, was so unbelievable and so shocking that your brain is just like willing to latch onto any bizarre explanation of it that doesn't involve, uh, you know, wow, her, she actually did that thing. Yeah, exactly. And now, did she ultimately admit to you that she'd made it up? No. I mean, there was a point at which it was no longer feasible to say that it was all true because it was just so obvious that it wasn't. But again, she just sort of, and it's it's one of the most crazy making things about dealing with someone like this. And again, something that I have now seen as a pattern and, and over the last two seasons of the podcast, I've gotten to interview lots of friends and family members and doctors who've dealt with people who have these same behavior patterns. And it's something that we all sort of, it's a, it's very much a sh- shared experience, especially in season one, I interviewed, you know, Hope Yabara's siblings and and we just all sort of talked about, like, you you can just sort of never pin them down. It's like there is this, they sort of have an answer for everything. And it's never just, yes, I did that. That was hurtful. I'm so sorry. It's never that. You know, it's always like, well, I did it because of this. And, you know, tears. I mean, again, like, it's this, you know, just crying. And I'm, and sort of, again, just evoking back to sort of evoking sympathy, right? Where you just some, somehow now you feel like you're being cruel by pressing the issue. And yeah, it's just they're very, very adept at playing the victim and making any situation, even if they are the person who is very much culpable for causing other people pain, they still somehow are able to to make themselves the, the victim. And it's really hard to be a person who is, you know, again, not playing by that playbook, right? Having sort of the more standard emotional reactions to things. It's it's very hard to stay on solid ground at all. I mean, I just, I always felt like with my sister, it, it was like there was a reality distortion field around her. And when I was talking to her, I couldn't hang on to the truth. Yeah, that's so interesting because we see this idea of a reality distortion field from other people as well, right? People often talk about like entrepreneurs as having reality distortion field. When they're pitching you, you can get persuaded that their thing is going to be the next big thing. And then they you don't see them for a week and you're like, what, what were they talking about? Like, it's such a stupid idea, but you know, somehow it seems so compelling. Um, so I just think this idea of reality distortion is, is so fascinating and important. And of course, cult leaders have this too, right? A cult leader kind of distorts reality and, of the people around them and makes them think that all kinds of wacky things are true. And they really have trouble seeing past that. But this seems like a sort of a very particular type of reality distortion field. It's, and so I'm wondering, like, okay, let's say you tried to pin someone like this down by just saying, okay, well, give me the facts. Like, you know, when did you first find out you were pregnant? Okay, can you show me the hospital records, et cetera? How might they respond to that to kind of deflect so that you can't actually investigate it? Well, I'll tell you, I'll tell you exactly, because I have I have kind of a couple of instances of, you know, one of the things that came up in um as I was doing this digging about my sister's case and what was in the public record and and some of what was in the public record to my surprise was a bunch of emails between her and her husband and my father from around the first case right so tw- from 12 years ago and he's asking so the first case against my sister there was an investigation by CPS not by the police my parents and I had really deep concerns because my sister was telling us again things about her son's health that were not adding up. And of course, we had this backstory of her doing all these strange things with her own health. 
And after the CPS case was dismissed, there was this time when my dad was speaking to the two of them again. And he kept asking, he kept saying, you know, I want reassurance that you're saying there's nothing to worry about. You're saying this was all a mistake, that she was never lying about his health, about her son's health. I want to see the medical records. And they kept saying, no, that's not appropriate. You shouldn't be asking that. This is the wrong time for that. <laughs> like, it's just sort of these evasive maneuvers, you know? And so I think that is sort of what you deal with, right? It's like, and this sort of like, there was this tone in that conversation of, no, you can't see that. And how dare you ask? And that is sort of where she was always coming from. Like whenever I tried to pin her down for something, it was like, how could you ask me that? How could you think that I would do that? The final conversation that I had with her that may very well be the final conversation I have with her in my life was during the first investigation. And I said, it's probably the only time I ever really confronted her really directly about the fake pregnancy. You know, I, I told her, I said, I love you, but I really think you need help. I'm really worried about my nephew. And I'm not basically willing to say that I don't think there's anything wrong here. And she said, you know, how could you just sort of, yeah, I was just very indignant. Like, how could you possibly think I would be capable of this? And I said, well, you lied to me about an entire pregnancy. And her response to that was, I don't know why you're bringing that up now. And I was like, well, it's, you know, yeah, it's germane, right? But that is the exact sort of, that's the way of dealing it. It's that, you know, again, like deny, justify, minimize, <laughs> blame. And so that's just the pattern I've seen her play out again and again and again. And even when I, you know, I, when I sat down and interviewed Hope Yabara, who, someone who spent 10 years in jail for it, um, you know, she says that she had this diabetic coma, spoiler alert, didn't happen. And doesn't remember anything. So she'll say, well, yeah, I, I know I did those things because the doctor said I did them, but I, I don't know why I did them because I don't remember doing them. <laughs> and so it's just like you can sort of never, you can never pin them down. That's an absolute hallmark of, of the personality. Now, that mechanism for getting out of those questions, does it make you feel guilty when they do that? Is that what they're trying to evoke so that you change the topic? For me, that is how, certainly that is how I always felt. I always felt like somehow when I was trying to hold her accountable, I was bullying her or picking on her. And and certainly that's that's the language her husband has used. You know, he wrote a bunch of social media posts about me and the show when the show first came out. And that was the language he used. He kept saying, this this person is just bullying her sister. Oh, oh, because he, at that time, he was not on your side. Oh, he's still not. I mean, he's still, oh, he's still, he still just side. says I'm a liar and, you know, there's nothing to all of this and et cetera, et cetera. So, I mean, but he he said, oh, you're just, you're bullying her. And, you know, and that's, and that's kind of the, the language that she's used about me and about my parents is that we're toxic and she's, and it's just, you know, so it's sort of like, yeah, you're framed as you're framed as sort of picking on the person and being cruel that you would even accuse them of, of doing a thing, even if you have very strong evidence that they are doing that thing or have done that thing. And it sort of doesn't matter. I mean, it's sort of like, it's really illuminated for me how there's reality and there are facts and there's evidence. And then there's sort of everyone's story about what happened. And those two things do not necessarily have any relationship to each other. Mm. It sounds almost like a form of weaponized guilt. Oh, yes. Yes. But I think the story point is also a really interesting one where some people are so focused on a story that it's the story that matters, not the reality. And I think we all, you know, there's a natural spectrum of that where you know, in, in different people's lives, some people are more sort of like story type people and some people are more fact based type people. But this is almost taken to an extreme where I actually wonder whether people with this disorder believe their own stories a lot of the time. And, and so I'm curious about that. And maybe it's hard to know. But do you think that they sometimes actually believe what they're saying in the moment? That was one of my biggest questions going into this. And, you know, to your point about being story people or fact people, I mean, I'm a novelist. Like, I, I'm, I am a story person. Um, but, you know, I, I, that was one of my biggest questions was it seemed like when I was talking to my sister 
that she wholeheartedly believed what she was saying. And so I wondered, is there some aspect of delusions? Has she convinced herself that things happened the way that, that they did? And I spoke to a wonderful colleague of mine on the show, Dr. Mary Sanders, who has done a lot of work particularly on treatment for Munchausen by proxy perpetrators and has worked with a lot of perpetrators. And in talking to them about their experiences, the way she described it was that they become very adept at compartmentalization and justification. So it's a conscious act. They understand their child's not sick or, you know, as sick as they're saying or what, whatever the case may be, but they are able to sort of put that away in their brain and give themselves over to, you know, to the story, to the fiction. And they're also able to find ways to justify their behavior, right? So they can say, well, yes, you know, I'm keeping my child in the hospital for, you know, <laughs> nine months out of the year, but look, they're getting to, you know, go on a make-a-wish trip to Disneyland, or they're getting to have all these special opportunities. They're getting to have the newspaper come and do a story about this, you know, brave sick kid, or they're getting to have a celebrity come and, and meet them. And that they just find ways to convince themselves that what they're doing somehow actually benefits their child, which is wild to think about. But but that is that sort of is some insight into what's going on in their brain, which I, I thought very fascinating. And I, I could sort of it, it fit for me. Yeah, and especially ironic because they're essentially torturing their child. Right. And but, you know, from someone who's coming from the perspective of attention is the most important thing. Well, they are getting their child of attention through the child's illness. So, you know, maybe on some weird level, they're like, well, I'm giving this, I'm giving my child the thing that matters, which is they're getting a lot of attention and compassion. You know, no one has ever said that. And that is such a great insight. I mean, especially because a lot of times, like in my sister's case and in many other cases I've heard about, I, I do want to say not every person who has Munchausen behaviors will perpetrate on someone else if they have kids. Like, it's not a one-to-one. -one. It's very common for perpetrators to have Munchausen behaviors in their past, but not everyone who, you know, has Munchausen will hurt kids. It's not the same, you know, I think I think there is something psychopathic going on with people who are able to have a low enough level of empathy to put their child's life at risk, obviously. But that is such an interesting point because a lot of times people with Munchausen behaviors will be willing to put their own health at risk and they they will do things to themselves, make themselves sick, right? Because they need that attention so badly. So that may be part of the justification. That's a great insight. Let's talk about the empathy point because Imagine that you really, really cared about attention. It was sort of the most important thing to you. You still wouldn't torture your child, right? Because you would just be like, well, you have empathy and love for your child and compassion, right? Like you wouldn't even torture someone else's child because for those reasons, right? Like even if it was that important to you. So it feels like it can't just be explained by this really strong drive for attention. There has to be something else around why are they not being limited by their compassion. And is anything known about whether they don't experience empathy or they have just really diminished empathy? I mean, I certainly think it's pretty accepted that on, especially on the extreme end of the spectrum, right? Because there there are some of these behaviors that, um, and they're all serious, right? They all affect children negatively. So even if you are only in the fabrication stages where you're just telling your child they have, a, you know, an illness that they don't have, and, you know, that that's still very damaging to a child's sense of self and their own connection with their body and their ability to trust you as your caretaker, right? It's all serious. So with that said, Obviously, not all of this behavior is the same amount of life-threatening. I think when you get cases like the ones we talk about on the podcast, for the most part, which are people who have starved their children, who have poisoned their children, who have taken blood out of their children, these are things that, again, are so depraved that None of us like that. That is the place where this behavior just ceases to be relatable in any way. Right. Where you just can't even imagine doing that to your worst enemy, let alone the person that you love and should be the most protective of your own child. You know, I I started working on this project when I was, you know, I, I was when I was writing my novel that sort of began this whole part of my life is when I was pregnant with my daughter. And that's 
big part of why that was all got brought up for me because I just sort of thought, oh my God. I mean, it really drove it home for me of like how protective you feel of your children and how you would just do anything to stop them from being harmed. And to see your child in pain as a mother is the most intolerable thing. I mean, I am the biggest baby about like even getting my kids their shots, you know, which of course I do because it's it's important and, and all that stuff. But like, you know, just even sitting there, you know, getting my baby his one-year-old vaccines, I was like a mess. You know, I mean, it's it's horrible to watch your, your children in pain. So I think, you know, it's, and this has not been studied as much as it could. As you can imagine, this is like, I mean, this is an incredibly taboo topic. There are a lot of people f- right now very vocally fighting the idea that this is even a real thing. So it has not been studied. This is not something that's getting, you know, big amounts of research dollars or anything. So, I mean, there's so much study, I think, that that still needs to be done for me, in my understanding, not being a clinician um, or a psychiatrist. But the sort of psychopathy, sociopathy element, it has to be there because there is no way that you could have the capacity for empathy and do these things to your child. I just, I don't see how those two things could coexist. And then you also look at the way that, you know, they treat everyone else in their in their lives. It's not that they're not capable of ever behaving in a loving way towards their children or towards other people, but the genuine empathy, I, I just don't think is is there at all. One distinction that I think about quite often is the distinction between narcissism and sociopathy. Because those two traits, if you want to call them that, have a lot in common, but they're definitely not the same thing. And when I think about Munchausen by proxy, it strikes me as somewhat more narcissistic than sociopathic, just in the sense that it's so attention-seeking. And I think of narcissists as being very attention-seeking, whereas um, sociopaths, they might be trying to get some goal that they care about, but it's not really so attention-directed. So I wonder, is there anything known or just from your own experience, what links you've seen between this disorder and narcissism? Yes. Well, there is a known link. So there is a a high occurrence of cluster B personality disorders, which includes narcissistic personality disorder. And certainly you see a lot of those traits in these offenders. So what has been driven home for me about these offenders is that because I've had to spend a lot of time with it, right? It's it's very tempting even for me, and I think for even people who've worked on this issue for, you know, 30, 40 years to sort of believe in some humanity, capacity for redemption. I'm not sure if I believe in that for the people who have really put their children's lives at risk. I'm just not sure some of these behaviors, I'm just not sure there's any coming back from it. And that is a really horrible thing to sit with. And again, that's a, that's a personal belief, you know. I just think there are sort of lines that you can cross where you have really forsaken your humanity. And I think putting your child's risk, life at risk to get your emotional needs met is one of those lines. And it's not that I don't see the humanity in offenders. You know, I met again with Hope Yabara, who did absolutely monstrous things to her daughter and fortunately was stopped, fortunately was put in prison and has no had no contact with her children and they're grown up now. And and I I felt a sort of human empathy for her when I was talking to her. She seemed very warm. She seemed genuine when she was saying how sorry she she was for for what she did. But when I took a step back, I just thought, no, I think I'm being played here a little bit or i think i think she's just trying to elicit that sympathy and i i just think there's there's sort of a a line that you can cross now and that's not to say that i don't believe that i i think my colleagues who are working on treatment protocols for offenders and, and and work on that side of things i think that's really noble work and i really admire them i'm not sure how much i think it's possible Right. You bring up kind of two interesting things here. One is, is it possible to change when you've gone so far to, you know, all the way to the point of torturing your child for attention, right? The other is, is it forgivable? Like, could someone ever be forgiven in such a circumstance? And I think they're both really interesting questions. On the forgiveness piece, I feel like it'd be very hard to ever forgive someone like that unless you really knew for sure that they were a completely different person now. 
like like the extreme example, imagine that they had a brain tumor and that is what caused that behavior. And then the brain tumor is removed. And now they, you know that they would never do it again. Then you're kind of like, yes, okay, that was horrible what they did. But somehow they are no longer that person who did the thing. So I'm wondering what you think about in that kind of scenario where you can really say, make a clean break and say, yes, they are not the same person anymore. That's such a great, that's such an interesting question. I mean, I've really gone through this own evolution, this evolution in my own life, which has, has been very painful, where I went from thinking of my sister as, because we were close growing up, I had a happy child with her, hood with her. It was not like always, you know, this darkness that was sort of looming, you know, <laughs> like it, it was always, she was very well liked growing up. She had lots of friends. She was very charming and warm and smart and had very many, many good traits and qualities and was a person I loved very much. And I went from thinking at the beginning of this, I loved her. And then at some point she was gone right? Like there was a deterioration. There was escalations of those behaviors. And at some point, the person I loved was no longer there. She was no longer someone I recognized. And when I look at it now, I feel like maybe the person I loved was never there to begin with. And that is a much harder thing to live with, but I think it's true. I, I think, and you know, again, not, not all of my professional colleagues, I think would agree with that, that this is something that is just sort of in someone. But for me, that that has been my experience. And I think with the question of forgiveness, I think there's like, forgiveness means many different things, right? There's sort of the forgiveness that we can have in our own selves, in our own hearts, just to ease our own suffering, right? To To extinguish our own angst about a situation. And for that, you know, someone doesn't need to ask for that. And then there's the forgiveness that someone asks for. And my sister would say she doesn't need anything to be forgiven for anything, that in fact, I'm the one that should be asking for forgiveness for all the wrong assumptions I've made about her, et cetera. So, so in terms of that, you know, that, that exchange just isn't sort of on the table. When I look at, you know, I, I work with survivors now in, a, we have a, I have a 501c3 with some of my professional colleagues that, that offers support groups. And that's been a really wonderful thing. It's been really wonderful to meet survivors and, and really watch them do their best to move past this. And I just am never failed to be amazed by, by how strong some of them are. And their resilience of people is really incredible. But it's really been interesting to watch them rec rec and try and like sort of decide if they should forgive their own mothers, right? And to me, I think that they should forgive them if that's going to help them. They shouldn't if it's not. Because I don't think that someone does this is going to change. I mean, I, yeah, I, I, unfortunately, it's not as simple as, <laughs> I say simple, like removing a brain tumor obviously is not simple. But uh, unfortunately, it's not that simple. I, I wish I wish it were. I wish this was, was a chip that could be sort of removed. Because all of us who've been through these situations, and in particular, when I was talking to Hope Yabara's siblings, they had such a similar experience where they were like, we remember this person that we grew up with, and she was not this. She was not this monster. She was fun and funny and and loving, and she was a great role model, and she did this, that, and the other good thing, you know? And it, it's really hard to reconcile that those two people could be walking around in the same body. It reminds me of cases of romance scams where people will get chatted up on, you know, Facebook, Messenger, that kind of thing, by an attractive person of the gender they're attracted to, and they'll chat with them over a period of months, and they get to know each other, and they'll fall in love. And eventually the person will ask them for money and they'll get scammed. And what they'll often discover is that the, the person never really existed at all, that they thought they were in love with. It was a person, maybe the person's already married and they were putting on a whole persona and pretending to be someone else. But I think there's that, there's that moment when they realize, wait, this person I'm in love with doesn't actually exist. Like, yes, there is a person on the other line, at the other end of the line, but that is not the person in my mind, right? that kind of total shock. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I think I've gone back and forth, right? And it's been it's been a really constant evolution for me of of how I think about all these things as I just have all of these new things to add to my understanding. And I started this podcast project because of my curiosity about all of this, my my desire to understand. And and I think that I've gotten to a place where I can still hold that I have some really good memories of this person. But 
if that person was ever there. You know, and I I think that's one of the things that can really torture you, right, is that you can think about like, well, well, was there a moment like was there a moment when she started heading down this path and something could have been done? And that's something I'll never know the answer to because that's not what happened. And I wish for there to be more studies so that if there is some opportunity to intervene You know, when people are doing this behavior to themselves, when they're showing these other sort of traits that might make them, you know, susceptible to becoming this, could be headed in a healthier direction, could be taught more healthy coping mechanisms, could really get some help before they're just completely beyond that. But I'm trying to hold both things, you know, that I had a nice childhood with this person and that this person is, I mean, I can't sort of, um, can't erase the existence of a sibling, but that's not, you know, you're, it's like it, we were two, we're two years apart. Like there aren't any family pictures, family memories, anything, but don't involve her. And so to sort of like be able to hold on to a little bit of that and have it not all be painful to to think on. And then also really recognize that like, this is what happened and This is not, you know, to not minimize what came after. If you're like me, you'd really like to learn quick, practical tips for improving your life or understanding the world. But it's hard to know where to look, and it's easy to be overwhelmed by the flood of blogs, media sites, and academic papers. Well, there's good news. Once a week, we send out a newsletter called One Helpful Idea, where we distill down a single idea that we think you'll find to be valuable. We know you're busy, so each idea is formatted to be read in just 30 seconds. And at the bottom of the newsletter, we also include links to that week's new podcast episodes, which is a great way to keep up with the podcast. And we include, in each email, a newly released essay by Spencer. So if you only listen to our podcast, you're missing out on a lot of our content. To sign up for the One Helpful Idea newsletter and start receiving bite-sized ideas once a week, visit clearerthinkingpodcast.com slash newsletter. Looking back at your childhood spent together, are there personality traits that you observed that sort of were maybe precursors of this, whether it's uh, narcissistic personality traits or low empathy or just a lot of attention seeking even before sort of engaging in the more extreme forms of this behavior? Yeah, I mean, I certainly think that You know, for my parents, looking back, I think there are things that there's a lot of things that they noticed that, you know, I just didn't just sort of slipped by me because I was I was so young. But I certainly think, you know, some of the sort of um, the sort of more more histrionic behavior or the the, that sense that, like, if you tried to confront her on something, she would cry and blame you. Like, I think that could be. But that's also like a lot of people could have that quality and not, you know, (laughs) go, go on to do to do these things. But I think, you know, if anything, I think when part of the thing that was so confusing, I mean, certainly by the time we were teenagers, there was a lot of that deceptiveness that was coming up. And there was some some behaviors that were really strange, like where you would where I would see something happen. And then she would tell me a different version of what happened. And it was a completely opposite version. And I would just feel you know, confused. So certainly that that's a thing, you know, that's a thing that happened. But in terms of like ever having thought of her as a person with low empathy, no. I mean, if anything, what she seems like, and I, and I think probably, I mean, I haven't talked to her in a very long time, but like, I think probably still now, I think part of what really fools people is that she seems incredibly loving. She seems incredibly kind and warm. She was a nurse back when she was younger and she was, I think, good at that job. I think patients loved her. You know, I mean, I, she's a, she seems like a very caring person. So I, I certainly would never have thought that underneath that actually was not real empathy. I think it, and now I believe that now I believe it was probably for a long time, at least in part, a performance of empathy, not actual empathy. But yeah, I mean, I I did certainly would never have thought we would end up here, not in a million years. What about uh, in terms of attention seeking? Did did she have signs of that? (laughs) I mean, not any more than really anyone else. I mean, I think like, I think certainly like there were, you know, and again, I don't know which of these things were 
exaggerated, which were completely fabricated. But, you know, she had like when we were teenagers, she had all this stuff with her knee and then she had surgery and then her back and had surgery on her back and had like a weird back brace that she was wearing for a summer. So certainly there was the idea of like she likes to, in my mind, my interpretation of it as a kid was like she really likes to play it up when she's got, you know, a thing going on. Right. So I think there was that. But like, again, did that necessarily stand out from other people? I I don't know. You know, and again, it's just like this was I was two years younger than her. I was a kid. I was involved in my own whatever I was doing. <laughs> so it's like, you know, I just wasn't necessarily watching for it. But I think also it's really funny when we talk about attention seeking, right? Like, because we all want attention. And I think like I I think that in the Internet age, maybe we are a little bit more poised to understand how strong of a human drive that is because we see all these social media companies capitalizing it on it, right? It's like, what do they traffic in? They traffic in likes and reshares and, you know, I mean, to to watch your, you know, post get attention or watch your podcast go up the charts or whatever it is, right? It's like, we we all, uh, that's a pretty human thing, right? To To want attention. And I think like, I was certainly always a person that maybe more wanted attention for like my accomplishments, right? I wanted to be good at sports and be good at school. And, and, you know, I I think maybe that there was that I noticed that like she wanted maybe more in the sympathy realm and also that she was very good at giving sympathy. I mean, I, I knew that like my sister was a person that I could go to if I had something bad going on, right? Like if I had a breakup or if I had some health thing or like, you know, she was a nurse. So I used to call her about every little like thing I was paranoid about, you know, and it's like she was always really good in that role. And so I think it just, yeah, I mean, I I don't think there was any like massive red flags. Now, looking at it through the lens of what I know now, I could probably find some things, but it's that's the hindsight is 2020 kind of thing. I think these just really seemed like personality differences when we were younger, you know, and certainly it's like it's it is funny to be working so deeply in this because just being out in the world, you know, there are plenty of people who really, really like to talk about their ailments and their illnesses and like will tell you about the time they like, you know, (laughs) had some illness or their difficult pregnancy or whatever it is. And like, we'll talk your ear off about it, right? Who do not have this disorder. Like there are plenty of people who really like to to talk about and have attention for and sympathy for the things they're going through, but would never take the step of like fabricating things, of lying about them. You know, so it's like there there is a range of this that is just a very sort of normal human behavior. Right. I mean, this set of traits, like any human traits, are going to lie on a spectrum. And we're talking here about the really far end of this spectrum. And to that point, before we wrap up, I, I want to ask you about your meeting with Hope Yabara, who you've mentioned a, a few times. She's kind of the the, maybe the most famous example of this. And there was something that really struck me when I was listening to the audio you produced about your meeting. Uh, could you just tell us a story about how you were playing something to her on your phone and what that was like? Oh, my goodness. Yes, probably the strangest moment during the strangest conversation I've ever had it, <laughs> in my life. So I went to meet with Hope Yabara in a diner in the small town where she lives. This is after many months of going back and forth of her agreeing to do an interview and then pulling out. And it was a whole drama, right? Um, and we finally got to meet with her. And one of Hope's long running bits, I don't know what you call it, a bit or a con or, or what have you, claims is that she is deaf because of... Um, and here's the irony upon irony. I believe she claims she was deaf because of treatment for her cancer, which, of course, she didn't have. But she says she is deaf. She sort of talks in this with this strange affectation. She does what I'm told is not actual real sign language. So I knew that she was going to do this. I was prepared for this. She did. She'd done a few other interviews and she'd done this in those interviews. So I, I knew that was coming. And, you know, I really went into my I went into my conversation with Hope Yabara with the tactic that, like, I am not going to try to confront this person with facts that will just shut them down. I want them to give me an interpretation of their experience. I want them to hopefully tell me some, you know, emotional truth for them and kind of get their perspective. Because if I sit here and say, why did you lie about this? Why did you lie about that? You know, it's just she'll just shut down. So we, my producer, Tina, and I met up with her. Her boyfriend also came. And 
she was pretending to be deaf. We played along with it um, and just said, oh, okay, you know, yeah. So oh, she saw I can read lips. Okay. All right. So we were talking about her siblings and my producer Tina said, I have, you know, I, I have some, some audio of, of Nick, her younger brother, you know, talking about you and saying some really nice things. Would you like to hear it? And her boyfriend jumped in and said, she can't hear it. She's deaf. And <laughs> there was this sort of completely strange theater where we were sitting there. And, and then Tina said, okay, my producer Tina said, okay, well, you know, we'll turn it up really loud. Well, she's deaf. She can't hear it all. Okay, well, I'll, I'll explain what he's saying on the tape so that she can read my lips and whatever. And we're sitting here and I'm like, Hope knows she's not deaf. We know Hope knows it, it like it's not deaf. I don't know if this boyfriend knows she's not deaf or if he's thinks he's covering for her or, or what the deal is here, but we all know she can hear this and we're playing it. And then Tina's explaining what he's saying. And it was so bizarre. And I was kind of watching her face to see if she was going to react to like hearing her brother's voice who she hasn't talked to in, you know, years and years. And it was just so strange. It was so strange of like, why, you know, and I think it is that it's like, the real commitment to the lie is it's almost like it's I think impressive is the wrong word, but you just think it's like, why, why, like, why bother? Like, what, what is what is this lie in this moment trying to accomplish? But it just sort of it's really you can see how much it's a compulsion, like she can't help herself. It's almost like a character actor stuck in the character permanently. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. And I think like I think to your point when you asked about, you know, do they believe it? I'm sure that keeping up those big lies, because it really is like, it does get to the point where their entire life is a lie, right? It's like, if you are lying about these serious things and you are lying all the time and you are lying about all these different things, right? Because it's never isolated. It's always like, once you scratch the surface, you find affairs and financial fraud and they were lying at work and they lied about their qualifications and it's like everything, you know? And so you can, I can only imagine that, someone's sense of self must get incredibly eroded over time doing that because how do you even keep track of who you are or what is true anymore if you're lying all the time it, it must be very difficult my last question for you is about people like the boyfriend in this example with hope you just mentioned or people like um, the partner of your sister who's was as you mentioned defending your sister on social media Clearly, there's an element of involving other people. And because we have such a strong will to believe the people in our life and, and the, the idea that they would be lying about so much is so outrageous and so unlikely, can you just talk a bit about how they involve other people sort of in the whole fraud, if you will? Yeah, I mean, in it's a really heartbreaking thing, right? Because I think, you know, and I, I'm of two minds on it, right? Because I think there's a certain point at which if you've been pulled into this, like, like Hope Yabara's boyfriend, right? Like, I mean, and who knows what's going on with him, but, you know, he he may well just believe everything she said and not understand that that he shouldn't, right? Who knows? Maybe he doesn't know how to Google things. I don't know. But, you know, I think there's a certain point where it's very forgivable to get pulled into one of these things. And one of the most heartbreaking things that you see, especially in Munchausen by proxy cases, is that these perpetrators will infiltrate spaces that are dedicated to parents who are going through the real thing, right? They will join these groups of parents at hospitals that have kids who have cancer. They will be, you know, because part of the other motivation is to be seen as this heroic parent, you know, and so they will be leading the fundraiser and they will be super involved in the organization for whatever, you know, disease their child allegedly has. And so they are infiltrating spaces full of people who are really going through these things and taking advantage of them. And that is heartbreaking. And then for those people when they realize that it has been a lie, I mean, the sense of betrayal upon what is already a horrible situation of having a sick child is is obviously horrific. So I think a lot of people can be forgiven for believing a lot of things. I think there is a Rubicon where you have been confronted with enough evidence from enough different sources where it is no longer acceptable that you are supporting this person. And especially if you are the other parent of those children, 
as my brother-in-law is, right? I can see, even with like the first investigation, right? I can see him believing at that point, okay, this has all been a misunderstanding. It's all, they've got the wrong idea. Her parents have always been mean to her, whatever the justification is that, that he came up with. What I cannot understand is being 12 years down the road, she's been investigated a second time for your other child. It went across the exact same pattern. You've had multiple doctors from multiple different institutions calling in reports to CPS. It's sort of like once you have all of these people saying your spouse is putting your children at grave risk, if you do not step up and protect those children, that is unforgivable. And that's, I think, where that line is. So I understand you mentioned cult leaders earlier. There's actually, for survivors, they have to go through kind of a almost cult deprogramming process because that person's influence over them is so strong. And these offenders can be incredibly persuasive and incredibly strong-willed and convincing. So I understand how people fall under the spell. But I think once you've been confronted with enough evidence from enough people, then you are then responsible for whether or not you are going to continue to enable that person's behavior. And so I think there is some culpability that that eventually enters the chat. And I I love that question to ask yourself about anything you feel strongly convicted of, of like, what evidence would it take to change your mind? And if the answer is there's no evidence anyone could produce me with that would change my mind, then I think that you have gone to a place of belief that has nothing to do with fact anymore. The analogy to a cult leader is so strong, I think, because cult leaders often cause a great deal of harm. But in addition, they often induce really good people to cause a lot of harm for the belief system. And there's that moment where the victim becomes a perpetrator who's actually supporting the cult leader in the harm. And they kind of cross that threshold. And once they've crossed that threshold, now to admit that the cult leader is wrong is to actually admit that you yourself have caused all of this harm. And similarly, you know, if you've been you know, aiding your wife who's been torturing your child, at some point, you know, to go back on that and say, no, my wife is lying, you're, you're suddenly culpable for the torture of your child, which is such a hard thing to admit, right? Yeah, I think that there is. I mean, I agree. I think there's a line that where it's like it would be so annihilating to realize the truth that you will then do any backflip necessary to find another explanation other than that you've been wrong about this and that you've been aiding this person the whole time. Because I think that that, that thought is just so intolerable you know, you couldn't survive it. And that is why you see people sort of getting into, and, and not just in, in our case, but like in, in all the cases I've seen where the person has either a spouse or family members, you know, parents, siblings, whatever, who are supporting them, despite, you know, even a criminal conviction, right? Some people still just say they maintain their innocence no matter what. And I, I think it's because it would be so intolerable to admit it that there's just, it's like, there's sort of no turning back past past a certain point. And, and you know, I, I think to the point of like when I've thought about because I, I'm a sort of in this opposite position where I'm sort of always worried that I'm wrong because I think having been wrong about like realizing that I had believed, you know, for instance, that when my sister was pregnant um, and then finding out that that had all been a lie. I mean, that's so profoundly destabilizing that it's led me maybe maybe in a some in some ways a positive way to really question my own beliefs about everything. And I think with this, when I've thought about that with with my sister of like, what would convince me that I'm wrong? Right. Like what what would convince me now that actually I, I have been wrong this whole time and there is nothing to this. It would be any other reasonable explanation for all of these events, any other reasonable explanation. There just isn't one. Right. I mean, if your sister said, well, here are the medical records of me being pregnant, uh, right? Like, right. That, that would go a long way, right? You could right. prove it pretty easily. 
right? Here's the full here's the full medical records for my children. See, none of these doctors actually. I mean, I know that not to be true, but like, you know, if you, or if you could say, oh, actually, they have this thing that caused all these things. That, because that there are there are instances where where people are, and I don't say falsely accused, but where they're wrongly suspected where like a doctor will observe some patterns within a child that they think are suspicion for abuse. And then upon further investigation, there is some one in a million medical thing going on. And and the moment that that offender is separated from the child and the problem doesn't resolve, it's very obvious the offender is not the cause, right? So of course that happens. But in those cases, there's an explanation, right? It's like, well, we've removed mom and and the, the issue kept happening. So it's obviously not the mom. It's like, great, like things, sort of an Occam's razor thing. Like th- things do tend to to make sense. There are there are medical mysteries. There are, you know, but they don't look like this. They they look very different than what this looks like. Right. When you, uh, when a child goes away from their parents for a few weeks and suddenly recovers and then goes back right. and gets sick every time. Uh, yeah, that's a bit, a little bit of a smoking gun. But I do want to just finish by saying, while I think that this is way underdiagnosed, it's also still extremely rare. And if a parent has a sick child, you know, almost every single time they're going to be telling the truth about it. Or at worst, they're just going to be overly worried because, you know, they care about their child so much. But this, this cases of making it up are extremely rare. So we really shouldn't jump to doubting parents when their children are sick. No. And, you know, what I, what I yeah. always want to tell parents, because I have heard, especially because there's a lot of ballyhoo about sort of false accusations um, that I don't think are really false in most cases. But nonetheless, that is something I've heard from parents, right? Like, should I be worried? Should I be worried that I'm going to take my kid and they have some complex medical thing and a doctor is going to accuse me? And I always tell them, no, absolutely not. Because that is not how doctors think. I mean, most doctors, I think something that I I always want to reiterate, and this comes from from my colleagues, Dr. Jenny, Dr. Carol Jenny, who wrote the original book on uh, medical child abuse, one of the barriers to catching medical child abuse is that it is horrible for doctors to realize that this has happened on their watch, right? Pediatricians go into pediatrics because they want to help children to realize that they have been betrayed by a parent that they trusted and used to harm a child is a horrible thing to have to contemplate for them. So they will often look for, even in cases where it is legitimate abuse, look for any other explanation, look for anything they might have missed. Maybe it could be this. Maybe it could be that. I mean, this is honestly, from what I have seen, this is the last thing that doctors want to find. This is the last thing that they, you know, when these cases are, you know, do get to the case of like investigations and especially criminal investigations, it is because of multiple reports from multiple institutions over a period of years. Like this is not, this is not something that I'm sure there are cases where there are doctors who have made bad assumptions and made, you know, and and sort of bad medicine happens. People are jerks to parents. All of those things are real, very real. But like this is not something that doctors jump to. This is an absolute horrible violation for them to endure also. So I, I don't think it's something people should worry about being scrutinized for if if they are not lying to doctors. Andrea, thanks so much for coming on. Thank you so much for having me, Spencer. Thanks again for listening. We always love to hear from our listeners. So if you have questions or comments for us, just send us an email at clearerthinkingpodcast at gmail.com. This episode was edited by Ryan Kessler and transcribed by We Amplify. Miles Kestrin handles marketing for the podcast and Uri Bram is the podcast's factotum. If you like our show, then we'd really appreciate it if you could rate and review us wherever you get your podcasts and tell your friends about us on social media. We also hope you'll subscribe to our email newsletter called One Helpful Idea. Each week, we'll send you one idea that we think is really valuable that you can read about in just 30 seconds, along with that week's new podcast episodes, an essay by Spencer, and announcements about upcoming events. To sign up for that newsletter or to find show notes, transcripts, and more info about the show, visit podcast.clearerthinking.org. A listener asks, what is one of the biggest challenges you've had to overcome in your life? Two things come to mind for that for me. One of them is the challenge of having people who I love experiencing really difficult situations. For example, severe mental health challenges. So that has certainly been really difficult, having to try to help the people you love, seeing them suffer, feeling like you're unable to help them, 
in their really difficult circumstances or at least not help them as much as you would want to and then seeing their suffering continue. That's, that I think really has been some difficult challenges in my life. The other thing is that I'm a worrying type personality. And so I think I'm the sort of person that my brain tends to scan for danger. Being the kind of person that is always looking for something to worry about, I think has been a challenge. And thankfully I've made a ton of progress with that, but still I would say that I worry more than the typical person despite having spent years improving. And so I'm much better in that way than I was, but I'm still wish that I worried less and it's still a work in progress.